My name is Miriam Rahman. I'm one of the neurosurgeons at the University of Florida. I have a specialty interest in brain tumors and brain tumor immunotherapy. Today I'm going to be talking about glioblastoma, diagnostic and therapeutic strategies. Let's begin. I have no disclosures for this talk. The overview of what we're, we will review today. Risk factors for developing gliomas. The pathology and the molecular features that are now very important as diagnostic tools. RAINO criteria for following patients with imaging over time, and what standard treatment is for newly diagnosed GBM. What I really want you to get out of this talk by the end is understanding the new pathologic criteria for diagnosing glioblastoma, how to interpret RAINO criteria and follow MRI scans on these patients over time, and what the standard treatment is for GBM. These are the questions I expect you to be able to answer by the end of this talk. An infiltrating glioma that is IDH1 wild type without necrosis is considered a GBM if A, it has enhancement on imaging, B, it crosses midline on imaging, C, has a retinoblastoma mutation, D, has a uh, promoter mutation, or E, has a sonic hedgehog mutation. And we will talk about the answers to these at the end. Next question. Is this 8 millimeter lesion a measurable lesion based on modified RAINO criteria? Yes or no? Last question. Standard treatment with radiotherapy and temozolomide, or TMZ, is most likely to result in survival benefit in which patient population? A, patients with methylated MGMT promoter, or patient B, patients with an unmethylated MGMT promoter. So we're going to talk briefly about um, GBM. Let's start with epidemiology. Um, what the data you're looking at here is from the Central Brain Tumor Registry uh, at the, of the U.S., a CBR, a CB Trust, which is published in the um, Neuro Oncology Journal each year. And there's approximately 10,000 new cases of GBM each year. Those are the newly diagnosed cases, and of course there's a, a prevalence um, that continues each year. And what you're looking at here are the age uh, ranges and the likelihood of having a brain tumor. And as you can see, uh, the incidence is higher in younger patients, and as you age, that incidence uh, falls behind breast cancer, prostate, and lung cancers. Uh, but as um, most folks know, um, the diagnosis of GBM is very devastating, and we continue to have a lot of work to do in terms of finding a better um, treatment to result in a better prognosis. Risk factors for GBM. The only known risk factor is exposure to prior ionizing radiation, especially in childhood. You will get a question about the exposure to Agent Orange, especially amongst our veterans. We currently have no data. Uh, cell phones, uh, there have been a lot of research studies looking at the uh, risk factors of cell phone usage. These, datas are th these data are inherently flawed. The only way to do these studies is really to do a case control analysis, which is to take patients who have no brain tumors and ask them to recall how much they use their cell phone, and then take patients with brain tumors and ask them how much cell phone use they had over the preceding years. But there was a meta-analysis of 11 of these large case control studies, and there was a slightly increased odds ratio for developing an ipsilateral uh, acoustic neuroma of 2.4 or a glioma, that um, odds ratio was 2, and this tumor latency was 10 years. Uh, and then there was a very large Interphone International case control study, and those who had the highest recorded times of cell phone use had a slightly increased odds ratio for developing a glioma of 1.4, but you can see here that the confidence interval was very wide. And so ultimately, the bottom line is cell phones may be associated with increased risk of brain tumors, but we still don't have any definitive data. This is how we used to diagnose these tumors. We used the St. Anne Mayo criteria, and then this developed into the uh, World Health Organization, or WHO, criteria. And previously, each of these factors would get a point, so nuclear atypia, uh, mitosis, capillary endothelial proliferation, and of course necrosis, and if you had all four, that was a grade four GBM. Uh, and then that kind of morphed into grade, um, WHO criteria, grade two being an astrocytoma, where you would typically have the nuclear atypia, Grade 3 was the anaplastic astrocytoma where you'd have the end capillary endothelial proliferation and the mitoses, and then in grade 4, you really need a necrosis to come up with, to come to a grade 4 diagnosis. Um, the secondary stru structures of Scher were um, described many years ago in 1940, and these are important factors um, that lead to the resi resistant nature of these tumors, and these include diffuse parenchymal invasion, perivascular growth, subpeal surface growth, and invasion along the white matter tracts, which you can often see now radiologically on T2 or flare scans. Um, and these are important to understand, uh, but are no longer required for the diagnosis of a GBM. 
So again, that was all how we used to diagnose these tumors, and a lot of that has now changed through the C-IMPACT um, publications. So now, uh, important uh, for the molecular diagnosis of uh, glioblastoma is the presence of an IDH mutation. So uh, we're going to go through this one by one. There are a couple of ways to get to the diagnosis of GBM. In IDH1 wild-type tumors, which are going to be the majority of the cases, which are primary GBM that developed de novo, you can either have an IDH, uh, an infiltrating glioma that is IDH1 wild type. If there is necrosis, that is automatically a glioblastoma. If you don't have necrosis, but you do have one of these genetic parameters, an EGFR, uh, an EGFR amplification, a TERP promoter mutation, or addition of chromosome 7 or loss of chromosome 10, that is GBM. So without necrosis, you can come to a GBM diagnosis if you're IDH1 wild type with one of these three. And here's an uh, imaging example of uh, one of my patients uh, who had this tumor. If you have an IDH1 mutation, that usually means it's a secondary GBM that um, developed from a lower grade glioma. Again, if you have necrosis, automatically a GBM. If you don't have necrosis, but you do have this CDKN2A deletion, that is also a GBM, and this is an example of that. And then, of course, there's a separate category now, which is the diffuse midline glioma, and that has this H. 3K27M mutation, automatically a GBM. Another way to think about this, if you look at the histopathology and you have an infiltrating glioma, you have necrosis, GBM. If you don't have necrosis and you have IDH1 wild type and you have one of these three genetic alterations, that also gives you a diagnosis of a GBM. And if you have an IDH1 a mutation and you have the CDKN2A deletion, also a GBM. So multiple molecular pathways that can take you down the road of getting the diagnosis of a glioblastoma. I'm going to take you through a case of a patient of mine. This is a 44-year-old woman who presented with a seizure, and she had this imaging that shows this diffuse T2 signal change in her left temporal lobe and her insula associated with very patchy enhancement. She went to another institution where she underwent a biopsy, uh, and she was told that she had a low-grade glioma, uh, she then presented to UF, and we recommended a surgical resection. So she underwent surgery uh, with a weight cortical mapping uh, for an aggressive resection of her tumor. This was her path report in 2016. Infiltrating glioma, WHO grade 3, anaplastic astrocytoma. She was he had an IDH1 non-mutated, ATRX non-mutated, TERT mutation, EGFR copy number gain, CDK N2A copy number loss, and P10 copy number loss, and RB1 copy number loss. She did not have necrosis, but she did have these findings. But again, this was before the C-IMPACT paper, so this was considered a grade 3 anaplastic astrocytoma back then. She was treated with 60-grade radiation and concomitant temozolomide, which is our STUP protocol that we often use for high-grade gliomas. She then completed adjuvant temozolomide cycles in 2017. In 2018, she had a concern for recurrent disease. And this is her scan here. So remember before, she just had that patchy enhancement. This is her functional MRI scan, and uh, the colorful signals you see here are um, her uh, language mapping on her brain. And you see now this uh, contrast-enhancing lesion um, along the left kind of frontal or per deep frontal operculum that she did not have previously. So she underwent, again, a left uh, awake craniotomy with mapping of the brain for resection of the tumor. And her path this time did show necrosis. So she was given a diagnosis of glioblastoma. It was IDH wild type again, ITRX wild type again. This was her immediate post-op imaging uh, that demonstrates a gross total resection of the enhancing nodule. But as we, w once we obtained this imaging, we noticed a new area of enhancement aloft along her left occipital lobe right here that had not been present previously. And so um, she was then enrolled in uh, one of our clinical trials, and so she underwent laser ablation of the left occipital lobe using laser interstitial thermotherapy, and it was combined with immunotherapy with pembrolizumab. And she con continued through treatment and uh, required Avastin um, through her uh, treatment and she continued to have progression, and this was her last scan uh, before she expired. And she expired approximately uh, two and a half years after her initial diagnosis. Uh, so that case is kind of an illustration of how the molecular diagnostics of GBM have changed. And if she had had that original path report 
now she would have been characterized as a glioblastoma from the very onset. I'm going to switch gears now and talk about the response assessment in neuro-oncology or RAINO. Uh, these are the criteria that have been uh, created through a uh, multidisciplinary team uh, that has been uh, really led by the neuro-oncologist to establish a standardized way of assessing MRI scans on these patients, especially those enrolled in clinical trials. And the reason this is important is that the language that we use to determine when patients have had progression of their disease is important for determining uh, overall progression-free survival. And so this criteria now has been modified to be called the modified RENO criteria. There's also IRENO, which is for patients enrolled in immunotherapy trials. We're going to go through the basic framework. So this replaced the previous criteria, rhesus and McDonald criteria, but the basic framework still exists, which is that you can have stable disease, complete response, where there's no evidence of, of tumor on imaging, a partial response where you have some reduction of disease, progression, uh, or pseudoprogression, which was new in the RENO criteria and didn't exist before. So this is basically a comparison of the rhesus, McDonald, and RENO criteria. And things to note that with the RENO criteria, in addition to looking at the contrast-enhanced scans, the T2 flare is very important, as many know, with glioblastoma, and as we sh showed in the previous case, that some, some tumors enhance and some don't, and oftentimes, even with enhancement, disease can be pretty extensive on T2 flare that you don't see on the enhanced scan. So T2 flare is an important part of the RENO criteria assessment. Additionally, there is the definition of measurability, meaning that lesions that are less than a centimeter are actually considered non-measurable. You can still consider them and look at them and take uh, qualitatively note if they look worse, um, but you're not actually looking at measurements to determine if someone's progressed based if the lesion is immeasurable. Also, we consider the use of corticosteroids. So patients who are requiring increasing steroids, um, it makes you more concerned that those patients are having true progressive disease. And so that is a consideration in determining progression in RENO. And again, there is this now category of pseudoprogression, which means that contrast-enhanced imaging is worsening, but patients seem neurologically stable. Uh, and so uh, the pseudoprogression uh, category now exists. This is the criteria within RENO as to whether or not a lesion is measurable. So if you have a lesion, it's enhancing, and it's less than a centimeter in any of the diameters, it's actually considered a non-target lesion. You still describe it, but it's non-target. If it's at least a centimeter in one dimension or the other, then you take up to the five largest of those enhancing nodules, and those are your target lesions, and any others are non-target. You still describe those, but they're just considered non-target lesions. And then if you have non-enhancing disease that you see on T2 flare, that's not enhancing, still important to describe, but it's non-target because you can't technically get a good measurement of it. This is the, the workflow of how to use uh, the RENO assessments. And I'm going to take you through this chart uh, carefully because it's important. So again, this is designed for patients who enroll in clinical trials, but we use these criteria even uh, for regular clinical care. So a patient is entered into the study, they have an MRI scan, they complete surgery, and then they have their concurrent radiotherapy and temozolomide. And after radiotherapy, they're going to have this MRI, which is considered one. And when they start their adjuvant temozolomide or adjuvant therapy, if they're in a clinical trial, they'll have a, their first post-treatment scan, and that's considered N, okay? And if that scan shows any increase in tumor size compared to their post-RT scan of greater than 25% or greater than 40% volume increase, we're going to call that preliminary progression, okay? If they have a decrease um, in, their, um, in their target lesions, uh, or a general sense that any of the non-target lesions look better, that's a preliminary response, and that can either be a partial response, which is PR, or a complete response if you have disappearance of all the enhancing target lesions. And then, of course, if it looks the same as it did on the post-RT scan, that's stable disease. That's easy. Now, if you have preliminary progression and there's no indication for surgery or a biopsy because it's uh, within reasonable increase in size, you actually continue treatment because you're calling that preliminary progression, but you haven't actually confirmed it. Now, at any point in, in any of these, you can stop and have a biopsy or surgery to confirm progression. But if there's no indication to have a biopsy or surgery, you actually continue treatment. And on this repeat scan, which they're calling now N plus one, if you have another increase in volume, that's confirmed progression. 
but what you document as the date of progression is actually this initial N scan here. That's the date of progression. Um, if you actually have stable disease compared to this scan here, that's now confirmed pseudoprogression, which means that you get this inflammatory response in the, in the tumor from treatment with radiotherapy and chemotherapy or other treatments. And so if you have this in initial increase, but then it stabilizes or gets better, that's confirmed pseudoprogression. And then of course, if you had this preliminary response, but now you have an increase, you now go back to this preliminary um, progress progressive disease, which is the same thing here. And you have to, that's preliminary, so you have to confirm it on the next scan. And of course, if it's stable, it's durable response or stable disease. Now, what's interesting is in this, these patients here that have this confirmed pseudoprogression, because they had this worsening, then they actually were stable, so you confirm them with pseudoprogression. If you get the next scan and they've grown again, they've had another increase in the size or worsening of their scan, it's actually confirmed progressive disease. And in the case of these confirmed pseudoprogressions, you actually go back to this scan here to call it progressive disease. So the bottom line is the first worsening is considered preliminary progression, and that's what you document. And unless there's an indication for biopsy or surgery, you just continue through treatment. The second scan that's worsened is where you call it confirmed progressive disease, but the date of progression is the first worse scan. Okay, and that's how you determine the progression-free survival. So examples. Uh, this was a young man who was 33-year-old male, presented with this left thalamic lesion. He presented with a seizure. He underwent a biopsy. This was his pre-op scan. You can see this contrast-enhanced lesion. He then had a biopsy-confirmed glioblastoma as IDH1 wild type. He then underwent um, laser ablation, and this is his post-laser ablation scan. And then he was treated with radiotherapy and adjuvant temozolomide. And he's been in surveillance now for a couple of years, and this is his uh, post most recent scan. And so this is an example of a complete response because he had one target lesion, contrast enhancing, completely gone away and thankfully has been durable and hopefully it will stay that way. This is a 55-year-old female who also presented with a seizure. She had this right um, kind of splenial and deep occipital lesion. This was pre-op. She was treated with uh, par partial, well, she had a biopsy um, at an outside hospital and kind of a subtotal resection. She then had uh, radiotherapy and temozolomide. And um, then after she, and then she enrolled in one of our clinical trials where she received adjuvant temozolomide, optune, and pembrolizumab. And this is her most recent imaging, um, which is consi consistent with a partial response because she still doesn't have, does have enhancing lesions. I will note that this scan right here is an example of pseudoprogression because it is worse compared to her, um, this was worse compared to her immediate post-RT post scan. Uh, she had an enlargement of the enhancing area, but then it ultimately improved. And so she had this preliminary progression, but then it got better, and then it was confirmed pseudoprogression. This is an example of progressive disease. So this is a six-year-old male who presented with this very large right temporal tumor presenting with confusion. He underwent a gross total resection. This was his pre-radiotherapy scan. He was treated with RT. Post-RT, he had this nodular enhancement. But again, post-RT is kind of the first scan you start comparing to. He then had a subsequent scan with his first cycle of temozolomide, and this was considered preliminary progression because it was worse compared to his post-RT scan. But you continue treatment because he didn't have a lot of edema, didn't have any independent reason to take him for a biopsy or surgery. And then his subsequent scan showed increasing enhancement, worsening edema, worsening symptoms, needing steroids. This was then confirmed progression, and he underwent surgical resection that showed recurrence. Um, this is um, not a great example, but is also another example of pseudoprogression in the setting of treatment with laser ablation. Uh, this was a patient who was a 56-year-old many, many years ago in 2006, actually had a biopsy um, that showed a gemistocytic astrocytoma was treated with um, RT and temozolomide, now had this new uh, growing lesion in the uh, deep uh, posterior frontal lobe. And this was his functional MRI showing uh, its proximity to the cortical spinal tract. This was pre-op. This was post-laser uh, ablation. You can kind of see the increased area of enhancement. Then his next scan actually showed a little bit increased nodularity around that treatment area. And so this was considered preliminary progression. He then continued with pembrolizumab treatment and then had actually improvement in his scan, so that was confirmed pseudoprogression.
So we're talking a lot about these molecular diagnostics and about these imaging criteria, but ultimately, despite the improvement in all this characterization, the standard of care, or SOC, with for glioblastoma is still radiotherapy with DNA alkylating agents, which is temozolomide. And um, this is a courtesy, this slide is courtesy of Michael Weller and Tim Closey, but basically showing you no matter where you end up on this graph, the treatment is basically temozolomide and RT. So we're doing a lot of uh, gymnastics here to kind of figure out how to subcategorize patients, but ultimately the treatment we're offering them is the same. Standard treatment for, for GBM starts with radiation. These were very traditional studies uh, done in um, the 19, kind of late 1970s and 80s that established radiotherapy as standard of care, considered the Walker studies, and basically showed that overall survival with just supportive measures in these patients is very poor, 14 weeks, about three months, and that chemotherapy with BCNU really did not help, but RT significantly extended survival in these patients, and so became, quickly became standard of care. And then it took many years to make any further progress. And in 2005, the seminal paper was published um, by Roger Stoop and his colleagues, basically taking patients, randomizing them to get radiotherapy alone or radiotherapy plus temozolomide. Uh, and then once that uh, treatment with uh, radiation ended, to then continue six cycles of adjuvant temozolomide. This is a little bit controversial. Um, but really, this study looked at six cycles of temozolomide. You'll see that um, people talk about six to 12 cycles for patients, and many patients elect for um, 12 cycles. But the data really supports six cycles. And um, basically, in this study sh uh, showed that the temozolomide plus radiotherapy group had a significantly improved survival. And um, in addition to having this improved survival, you can see that the uh, percentage of patients who are alive at two years, three years, or four years, significantly higher than the RT alone group, showing that there's this tail of patients, even up to 10% of patients, who have this pretty prolonged survival, uh, even in the setting of glioblastoma. And so this is really what we're trying to achieve for all the patients. So the hazard ratio of death was significantly lowered when you added temozolomide to RT. Um, the companion uh, publication with this was demonstrated that the patients who really demonstrated a benefit with temozolomide were those who had an MGMT promoter that was methylated. So essentially, temozolomide is a DNA alkylating agent. It creates breaks in DNA, causing cell death. And cells that have an active MGMT, where the promoter is unmethylated, can then repair those DNA breaks and are basically resistant to temozolomide. And patients who have a silenced MGMT through promoter methylation don't have the ability to repair that. Um, damage done by the DNA alkylating agent and have a survival benefit. So you can see here that both MGMT promoter methylated groups, even those who received radiotherapy alone, did better than those who were unmethylated. So it's, it's, a, it's a favorable prognostic factor regardless of what treatment you receive. But if you add temozolomide to that, then those patients actually live significantly longer. And technically speaking, because the p-value was greater than 0.05, the patients who are unmethylated who received temozolomide did not technically have a survival benefit, although there's a trend for slight survival benefit. So methylated MGMT promoters associated with improved survival overall and better response to temozolomide. What's interesting is that this is a recent paper out of um, one of the high-profile European groups, is that you know traditionally in patients who are older, um, because of the concern that temozolomide may be too toxic and bone marrow suppressive, they're offered only radiotherapy alone um, to prevent the decline in functional status that can come with toxic combination therapies. Um, but in this paper, they looked at patients older than uh, 65 and found that, and uh, randomized them to receiving RT alone or temozolomide alone, so it's not combinatorial. And when they stratified them by MGMT status, they found that those who had the MGMT promoter that was methylated lived significantly longer in the TMZ alone group compared to all the other groups. So there is now a rationale that maybe instead of using RT alone, we should just use TMZ alone in patients who, who may be a little bit older and not be able to tolerate uh, combination treatment, especially in those who have an MGMT that's methylated. And now new standard of care for patients with GBM is the tumor treating fields or the Optune. And this was a study demonstrating that in the adjuvant setting, once you complete temozolomide RT, when you're getting your cycles of temozolomide, if you add the Optune device, that you further improve survival. 
and this was median overall survival from the time of randomization. In the combination group, it was 20.9 months, and in the TMZ alone group, it was 16 months. And this is now uh, part of standard care, although uh, patients who are enrolled in clinical trials do not always receive the Optune treatment. There is some controversy about uh, the validity of some of these results uh, due to the lack of a sham arm uh, in the study. Uh, however, it is now FDA approved for newly diagnosed GBM. So going back to the initial questions that we asked at the beginning, an infiltrating glioma that is IDH1 wild type without necrosis is considered a GBM if, and the correct answer is, if there is a TERP promoter mutation. And so this, um, without necrosis, if you have an IDH wild type tumor, infiltrating glioma, and you have this TERP promoter mutation, um, that is considered a GBM. Is this 8 millimeter lesion a measurable lesion based on modified Raynaud criteria? This is less than one centimeter in all dimensions, so the answer is actually no. So it is a lesion that you would follow, but is technically a non-target lesion. Standard treatment with radiotherapy and temozolomide is most likely to result in survival benefit in which patient population? And the correct answer is patients with a methylated MGMT promoter. In summary, glioblastoma is now characterized by necrosis or other molecular features. Standard treatment is 60 gray of radiotherapy, concomitant and adjuvant temozolomide, and the tumor treating fields. And the modified Raynaud criteria is used to follow lesions over time. I hope that was useful, and please do not hesitate to contact me if you have any further questions. I hope you have a great day.